Z2s rained on London by the thousand. There were many casualties, but the Nazis killed way more people building that weapon than they did using it. Z2s were made by slave labor in concentration camps. After the assassination attempt on Hitler, the SS took over everything and Dornberger was pushed out. Von Braun joined the SS and quickly reached the rank of Sturmbannführer. When it became clear Germany would lose the war, and with the Soviet army closing in on Penemünde, Von Braun and his entourage decided they would surrender to the US. Thousands left Penemünde for central Germany where Dornberger would rejoin them. From there, Von Braun, Dornberger and roughly 500 men moved to a resort hotel near the Austrian border and waited for the Americans to get close. Werner Von Braun's recruitment by the US was part of Operation Paperclip, in which about 1600 Germans working for Hitler were hired by the US government. Physicists, engineers, chemical weapons experts, you name it. Some were kidnapped, others, like Von Braun, came voluntarily. Among Von Braun's merry men were Kurt Diebus, who joined Hitler's brown shirts in 1933 and the SS in 40. He would become NASA's first director of launch operations. And Arthur Rudolph, who designed the Saturn V rocket with Von Braun before having to renounce his American citizenship to avoid being prosecuted for war crimes. My name is Sylvain Nobel, and this is Space Race 101. Once in the US, the government had Von Braun and his people build more V2s, assembling them from parts they'd scavenged in occupied Germany. Stalin, of course, didn't want to be left out, and boy, he didn't mess around. In 46, he kidnapped like 7,000 Germans at gunpoint and shipped them in trains to Moscow. They called it Operation Osoviakim, but they pronounced it better. There were quite a few people working on rockets in the Soviet Union, but the one we want to keep an eye on is called Sergei Korolev. Guess what they had him work on first? That's right, more V2s. Except they gave it another name, the R1. Now here's the thing, V2s kinda suck. They have a range of only 300 kilometers, about a third of them blow up at launch, and they have the accuracy of a Star Wars Stormtrooper. Still, it'll take a while before we get something better. By 1949, the Soviet Union has its own nuclear bomb, and we most definitely have a race. Now this time, the V2 won't cut it. Everyone wants one thing and one thing only, an intercontinental ballistic missile. This is kinda dark, why don't we take a break and science a bit? Jane from Philadelphia asks, Why do rockets all have these bell-shaped reactors? Well, thank you, Jane. That's a very good question. It's called a De Laval nozzle. Basically a tube that's squished down the middle. Combustion happens over here, and the pressure pushes the hot gas in that direction. When the passage narrows, it speeds up the hot gas, like uh, when you squeeze the end of a garden hose and the water comes out faster. And if you build your chamber just right, the gas will hit the speed of sound right here in the narrow part. Then something really cool happens. The gas changes properties. Then, if you want it to go faster, you need to make the passage wider instead of narrower. The gas will expand and pick up more speed until it comes out the reactor at over 10 times the speed of sound. Once Sergei Korolev got a working V2, I'm sorry, R1, he built a slightly better version of it, called the R2. Still suck. The R3 was supposed to have 10 times the range, but it was such a mess, it never even got built. Jump forward to 1953. Werner von Braun is still testing the first American ballistic missile, the PGM-11 Redstone, a descendant of the V-2 with roughly the same range, while Sergei Korolev starts working on a missile that can actually cross the Atlantic, the R-7. Of course, they gave it another name, they called it Semyorka, which is super cool if you don't speak Russian, otherwise it just means 7. On October 4, 1957, this R-7 rocket took off from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. It flew to an altitude of 223 kilometers before releasing a silver ball about this big with four antennas. It didn't do anything except to emit a radio signal, but that silver ball was the first human-made object to reach Earth's orbit. And that's how the Soviets won the space race. In our next episode, we'll talk more about Sputnik and what it took to get it up there, also dogs. I had to skip over most of it, but the way Werner von Braun escaped Germany is absolutely wild. You can learn all about it and a whole lot more in A History of What Comes Next. The book is fiction, but the historical events and the rockets are quite real. See you soon!